Yeah, we entered into chapter four and uh, we read out of the first few verses. Um, and in verse one, we see that Paul is giving them a series of instructions so that they may please the Lord, so that whatever they are doing may be pleasing to him. We don't live out um, the commandments of God because it's something that we are obliged to do. Rather, we follow God's instructions because we want to please him. That should be our ultimate goal. And Paul is glad and he says, you are in fact living in that way. You are leaving God pleasing lives and he's happy about it. But then he says, do this more and more. So stagnation is one of the greatest dangers in a believer's life. If a believer feels that they have made a lot of changes in their, you know, in, in, in their walk, uh, that they have uh, made sacrifices and improved and drawn closer to God, and then if they say, oh, good, now I have arrived, there's nothing more to be achieved. If, the, if that attitude sets in, then there is a uh, danger of backsliding. Because, um, you know, what this is what they, they say, the, uh, you know, when, they, when they're preaching from the pulpit, you're either going forward or you're going backward. It's not possible to stay in one place. So... If, you, if you're stagnating, you'll automatically start going backward. So the Lord's command is that we should continue to increase more and more in our uh, you know, maturity. We can never say, I have reached a certain level and this is enough for me. We are supposed to continue growing to higher levels of maturity. So he says, I urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus authorized Paul and the team to tell them that they can never be satisfied and sit back. They have to continue doing more. Okay, so, um, and so because they need to do more and more in this, uh, he begins by making one important, uh, you know, uh, yeah, by giving one very important instruction in the area of um, sanctification and purity. So he says in verse 3, um, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. And he says, each of you should learn to control your own body. Now, um, um, sexual temptations would attack different people differently. I mean, not everyone is obsessed with, you know, uh, sex the way the people of the world are. But every person gets targeted in this area in a different way. So each believer will have to um, learn how to control their own situations and their own temptations. Um, different people get attacked differently. So what in, in what ways does Satan generally attack you in this area of, you know, uh, sexual purity? So you would have to learn how to control yourself, how to protect yourself, shield yourself uh, in this particular area, depending on the schemes and strategies that Satan generally uses against you specifically. So there's no general instructions um, you know, uh, where you can say, OK, if you do this, 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 uh, then you will be completely immune to all kinds of um, uh, sexual temptation. There's no one set of rules. Each person will have their own temperament, their, their own social circles, um, the, 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 the kind of things they watch and they listen to. It differs from person to person. So the Lord will you know, impress upon your heart the steps that you need to personally take to strengthen yourself, to shield yourself, uh, to, you know, to, to protect yourself in this area. So you would have to learn by experience, to control your own body more and more. So this is an obligation to every, uh, uh, this is something that is given to every single believer as a commandment. Nobody can say, oh, you know, I mean, I'm a person who lives quite a decent life, so I don't have to worry about this. No, everyone will get attacked in the area of, uh, of uh, you know, impurity. So 
we all need to control our own body. Each person needs to figure out what steps they should personally take to sanctify themselves so that they will be holy and honorable. So what do you personally have to do to stay holy and honorable in the area of sexual purity? And then in verse 5, he says, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. So um, when uh, marriage ceremonies were conducted you know, in these um, Roman cities, uh, they would have a certain kind of uh, marriage vows, which, you know, here, Pastor John, if you could mute yourself, will I be able to mute my mute you from here? Um, I don't think there's a muting option. If you could just, <laughs> yeah, if you could just mute yourself, please. Okay. Um, yeah, what was I saying? Which verse was I in? Ah, yeah, the 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 passionate lust of the pagans who do not know God. Uh, so in the uh, Roman cities, uh, Pastor John, if you could just mute yourself, I'm unable to do it from. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. The in in the Roman cities, whenever they would have you know those uh, marriage ceremonies. Um, they would have a series of vows which would be said, but nothing was said about maintaining purity in marriage because um, it was considered an act of worship uh, uh, if they would go to uh, a temple and you know uh, sleep with one of the prostitutes over there. So temple prostitution was considered an honorable thing. It was an act of worship which uh, was used to honor certain Greek gods. That was the kind of city that they were living in. So their idea of marriage was very low. There's not much loyalty expected. So uh, in fact, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the initial ceremony itself, no mention was made about loyalty and faithfulness. It was in that kind of a setting that these uh, believers were living. And they had been unbelievers in the past, you know, so which means they too would have indulged in those kinds of lifestyles. So now when they have come to the Lord, this is the Lord's command to them, that they must sanctify themselves and learn to control their own body. Uh, so um, therefore, uh, even if you know, nobody can say that you know, we, are, oh, we are living in a, in, a, in a culture that is very fallen. The Thessalonians were living in a culture that was very fallen. But what was the Lord's standard for them? That they too should be holy and honorable. And how to be holy and honorable, each person would have to individually learn what steps they have to take to control their body. Um, so in verse 6 and verse 7, they are told to remain pure, not to take advantage of their brothers and sisters by having affairs. And then verse 8, it's a very, very strong statement being made over here. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So anyone who chooses to disobey in this one area is literally just rejecting God himself. So this is something very serious. Um, he says, this instruction, uh, if, you, if you ignore it, you're not just rejecting a human, but you're rejecting God himself. So because they were living in that kind of a culture, maybe you know Paul felt uh, in his heart that this is something that he should stress and emphasize. Even he had spoken to the Corinthians also who were living in that same kind of a heathen culture. He says to them in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? He says, whom you have received from God. So. Um, the same thought is being reflected over here in the Thessalonian letter. He says, if you reject this instruction, then you're rejecting God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So this is one area where we cannot compromise. We have been given 
the Holy Spirit by God through grace, freely, generously. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. And this Holy Spirit was willing to condescend to a low level where he's literally living in us. I mean, he doesn't need to, but he has chosen to do that. You know, it's a privilege which we have been given that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. He chooses to indwell us and live in us. So now we have to treat our bodies as his temple in a most holy and honorable manner. There is no, there is no you know, uh, leniency in this area. We are expected to be very honorable and holy when it comes to sexual purity. And then he moves on to the next point. He says, uh, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. I mean, imagine they are being faced with persecution from every side. People are speaking against them. People are working against them. Uh, some of the people who joined the church were, in fact, very well off. They had position status. And now it looks like as if you know they have lost their privileges. They are in a, in a rather bad shape. All this is happening to them. And the advice that is being given over here, the, God, the godly command that is being given over here is, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. So even though you are under attack, even though people who were earlier friendly towards you are now hitting out at you, even though what is rightfully your privilege as, uh, you know, as a citizen of one of those Roman cities, you know, because Thessalonica was also having that special privilege of being considered a Roman city. So when all those things are being attacked and being taken away from you, let there be no retaliation from your side. Don't resort to violence. Believers are never told anywhere to, you know, um, uh, to retaliate against their persecutors. So th their ambition, they should make it their ambition to lead a quiet life, he says. And then the next uh, point that he makes is, uh, you should mind your own business. This is such a very practical and relevant point, you know, where uh, uh, people try to interfere in other people's lives. Uh, Proverbs 25, 17 says something very nice, very, uh, very uh, useful. Proverbs 25, 17, it says in the NIV, it says, Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, too much of you, and they will hate you. You know, so um, don't get over involved in other people's uh, matters and, you know, uh, try to interfere and try to get involved and order them what they should do and how they should live. You know, mind your own business, he says, and work with your hands. So, um, you know, we talked about this earlier. Some of them were so eagerly expecting Jesus' immediate return that they had given up their jobs and they were happily living off others. Instead of supporting themselves and working hard, you know, they were taking advantage of the love of the believers and they were making the other people shell out money for them, which is actually not a very good thing to do. So he says, work with your hands so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. You see, this is the example which they had set for the uh, Thessalonians. When they were with the Thessalonians, they did not take money from them. They supported themselves. You know, he, he, he had said earlier, night and day we worked so that we don't have to take a penny from you so that we will be able to continue supporting ourselves and work for you. So that's the example which they have set. So, which is why the Thessalonian believers respect them. So Paul is saying, in the same way you people respect us, the, all, the all the people of the city who are watching you will equally respect you if you, you know, support yourselves and don't depend on others. So it is important for us to have a, a career, to earn a living, to support ourselves. If we are the kind who are just, you know, um, taking advantage of others and living off others, it creates a bad impression uh, for the Lord whom we serve. People will get a wrong idea about the, the king whom we serve. 
so we should be people who work hard um during the reformation time you know when uh, the you, when you had reformers like uh, martin luther and calvin and all these other you know great names coming forward and many people began to take their uh, spiritual walk seriously up to then it was only just rituals you know you pay money in the church uh, you 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 perform certain uh, penance uh, you know um, penance rituals you do uh, you give uh, money to the poor if you do those things uh, the, they were taught that uh, that will god will be satisfied and he'll allow them into heaven but now after the reformers came and they began to share the true gospel during that time uh, one of the things where christians you know the true christians began to take a stand is in the area of work unlike all the other employees who used to go to their uh, workplaces late and you know try to you know just kind of um, waste their time during the working hours uh, when situations were like that these christians they it was called the protestant work ethic so the christians everywhere you know in the in the west at that point of time in europe they all began to go to their offices exactly on time make sure that they're working throughout the day without wasting any time and they would only leave when it is actually time for them to leave they were not cutting corners so everyone else who was watching them began to see that there's a difference between the ones who just have the traditional religion and the true followers of christ so um uh, that way they in fact earned a lot of respect from society the church of course was very very angry with the protestants you know because they had uh, uh, you know stepped away from the catholic faith but the people who were watching this protestants developed great respect for them because these were hard peeping uh, hard working people who uh, served sincerely there was no cheating there was no hypocrisy i uh, you know uh, there was no duplicity where you work hard while the boss is there and once the boss goes you know you you sit around and you waste time there was no none of that happening at that time so they earned the respect of the society so paul says live in that way so that the people who are watching you will you know uh, uh, think favorably regarding the lord whom you serve um so after having talked about those things i think those were some specific instructions which god wanted him to give to these um, believers now he moves into the next topic uh, which is about the uh, resurrection so uh, if we could have someone read out for us from verse 13 up to verse 18 chapter 4 13 to 18 please if you could regard this as an actual classroom setup uh, if any of anyone any person could unmute and if you can read out chapter 4 verses 13 to 18 verse 13 but i do not want you to be ignorant Brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the lord therefore comfort one another with these words yes thank you we had touched upon this earlier uh, they they were under the impression those believers were under the impression that jesus would come back very very soon 
So uh, some of them gave up their jobs and uh, they all were eagerly waiting. But the years, uh, you know, were um, uh, like, I mean, um, before the coming of, the, of Jesus, some of them began to pass away. Okay, so the church was still very young. I'm sure years had not gone by. I'm sure it's just a matter of months. But during those months, it looks like certain people have passed away and have died. And so now the church is thinking, oh, Jesus has not yet come back and collected us and taken us to heaven. What's going to happen to these people who died, who placed their faith in the Lord and were waiting, but now they are dead? So they were worried that these people, because they have not been collected by Jesus, they would have probably gone to hell. So that was the deep concern which they had. And so they were mourning like the people of the world. The people of the world mourn when, when somebody dies because there is no hope left. They, uh, they, that, that person is lost to them forever. So there is just no hope and they weep and they mourn. Paul says, you don't need to be ignorant like those people. I want you to know that when Jesus comes back, those who have fallen asleep, you know, those who have died, will come back along with him. So he might not have physically come and collected them, but they are now safe in him. So this was not something that the Thessalonian believers were very aware of, and so they were concerned. So he sets them right regarding this thing. And he says something encouraging to them. In verse 16, he says, the dead in Christ will rise first. So... Um, it's talking about them rising from their graves. It's talking about resurrection over here, which means the people who have died and who have been buried or who have been cremated or who have may maybe been lost at sea and their bodies are somewhere in deep down in the ocean. Doesn't matter what has happened to, the, to these people who have died in Christ. These people, they're they will rise up first in the sense their dead bodies will be resurrected and they will be rejoined with their physical body. And then those who are still alive on the earth, they will then be caught up into the air. So when the second coming happens, or in, in, our, in, in this case, maybe, you know, for those of us who believe in rapture, we should say when the rapture happens, the it is the ones who have passed away, they will come along with Jesus. And even as they come along with Jesus, their physical bodies, which are somewhere on this earth, will be resurrected and they will be rejoined with their physical bodies. And then while that is happening in the air, those who are still on the earth, the believers who are on the earth waiting expectantly, they will then rise up into the air and meet with him. If, so if you look at the wording over here, there is some kind of an experience which will happen in the clouds. It says those who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So... There are different people who believe differently about the whole uh, rapture experience, but there is going to be some kind of a rapture experience that there is no doubt about. Something will happen in the clouds. A meeting with the Lord will take place in the air. That much is confirmed. As to how it will happen and when it will happen, that you know people um, differ uh, regarding that. So maybe very briefly, we could just touch upon that. Two main beliefs which are there regarding this experience where believers will be will rise into the air and be caught up in the clouds even as they're meeting the Lord. Two beliefs regarding this. So the belief one is this. Um, in Revelation chapter 6 all the way up to chapter 19, there's a time of very great persecution which is described in Revelation 6 to 19. It's called the tribulation period when there will be a lot of persecution against the church of God. So, belief one is basically this, that Jesus will come in the clouds. He will not come down to the earth. So, it's not a second coming. 
he will stay in the clouds and it is the believers who will rise into the air and meet with him so they say this will take place before the tribulation period begins those who believe in in the, in, in the first belief they say that this experience this rapture will take place before the tribulation period starts and then after the seven years of tribulation is completed then jesus will physically come down and set his feet on the earth where he literally has come down for the second time so that will be called the second coming when he just comes in the air and we rise up to meet him that will be called rapture and then after the seven years of tribulation when he literally comes and plants his feet on the ground that will be the time of the second coming so um but there's another passage which we need to keep in mind so tribulation happens from chapter 6 to chapter 19 and then chapter 20 there are four verses which talk about the rule of christ so in revelation 20 verses 1 to 4 if someone could actually read out that uh, then you know it would make more sense if somebody could just go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 4, please. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Yes. And that's okay. uh, no, no, yeah. Go on, go on. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Exactly. So here, it's talking about how Satan will be bound up for thousand years and thrown into something called the bottomless pit and during those thousand years Christ and the believers you know who have served him they will all reign together for a thousand years so that's basically called the millennial rule so where do we fit in this Thessalonian passage I know uh, when it comes to the timeline where exactly would it fit in so the belief one is that they will be uh, in a, a, a time of intense tribulation but before that intense tribulation can take place jesus will come in the clouds he will stay in the air it's the believers who will rise up to meet him and all those who have died before that they will come along with you know jesus and meet us in the clouds and then we will all together go back to heaven so the second coming does not happen at that point of time so the belief of those who hold this first position is that after the seven years of tribulation, then Jesus will actually come down to the earth. And at that point of time, Satan will be bound. He will be placed for a thousand years in a bottomless pit. And during those thousand years, Jesus will actually rule over here on this earth. The second belief is, um, uh, is different. They say, the, you know, they are called the... Uh, okay, the, the position that we talked about just now is the pre-millennium position. And there are those who believe in post-millennialism. That's the other viewpoint, the second belief. Post-millennials, they are under the impression that we are already living in the millennial period now. So they say, uh, you know, the people are getting saved, gospel is being preached. So yes, Satan is bound in the sense he cannot stop the progress of the gospel you know uh, the gospel is is getting spread from um, one uh, tribe to another and all the people groups are coming to the lord 
So in that sense, Satan is bound. He's not able to prevent the gospel from going forward. However, he's bound. Uh, he he's free in the sense he can he can he's even though he's bound in partially, he's also free partially because he's able to persecute the Christians. And so right now the millennial period is going on. And then uh, tribulation period will come when there is intense suffering. The whole church will go through all of it. And then at the end after that, then Jesus will come down in the clouds. And then the believers will rise up to meet him. And then they will not go back into heaven. Rather, he will come down and plant his feet on the ground. And that will be the second coming. So the second position is that the rapture and the second coming will happen simultaneously. He'll come in the clouds, believers will rise up, and then they'll all come together down, and the second coming takes place, and the rule of God continues. You know, I mean, he, 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 the final judgment is done, and then uh, uh, the, uh, Satan is put into the lake for fire, and uh, yeah, then the earth and the heavens will be rolled up, all of that. So we generally, I mean, hold to the uh, pre-millennial view where we believe that the rapture and the second coming will not happen simultaneously together, but they are two separate events. One happens before tribulation, one happens after tribulation. That is our belief. Um, and why do we hold on to that view? Um, based on Acts chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. So if we can have someone read out for us, Acts chapter 1. Verses 11 and 12, please. Verse 11, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Yes. Then they returned. Yes, yes, important. Yes, that felt is important. Go ahead. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So the ascension of Jesus into heaven took place on the Mount of Olives, and. Even as all the uh, followers of Jesus are staring up into the sky, even as he's you know uh, rising up into the clouds, uh, the angels they come and they say, in the same way he has gone up, in the same way he will again come down. So the expectation is that when Jesus comes back, when the second coming happens, it will be on the Mount of Olives. And there's something in the Old Testament which backs up this statement: Zechariah 14, three to four. So if someone could go to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 to 4, please. Zechariah 14, 3 to 4. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. So according to this passage, when the second coming happens, Jesus will actually literally come and plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. And that mountain will split into two and a great valley will be formed in the sense there'll be a great earthquake or something of that sort you know and then uh, god will defeat the enemies so when you look at the thessalonian passage it is not talking about jesus coming down to the mount of olives it's only talking about him being in the air and then believers will will, will rise up to meet him so which is why most of believers hold this you know this first view where Rapture is a separate event. He just comes into the clouds and we will meet him in the air and we will all be taken up into heaven with him. Then the seven years of severe persecution and tribulation will take place. After that, when he comes back, then at that time, 
he will descend upon the mount of olives there will be a great earthquake he, there will be a war which will be will be waged against all the enemies of god and then after the enemies of god are defeated then the thousand year rule of christ on the earth will begin uh, during which time satan is completely bound he cannot even act he can do nothing he is helpless in the bottomless uh, pit and then after that for a short while he is released again and he will again try to create some kind of a position and then there is a final battle and then that is the end uh, so uh, we would definitely say that the first Thessalonian 4 passage is talking about rapture event it is not talking about the second coming event so uh, that is basically how we would see it um, even as we are just dwelling on this um, concept you know we talked about pre-millennialism which is the view that we hold uh, then you have the post-millennial view where people are under the impression that we are already going through the millennium period and then when finally Jesus comes the rapture and the second coming will happen together that is the other belief system there is something else that is called uh, pre-terrorism the only reason I'm talking about these things is because it's there in your notes. Okay, so that, so that, so that uh, if you touch upon it, then you'll have an idea of what it is. So the other term that is mentioned in your notes is something called pre-terrorism. Pre-terrorism is basically the viewpoint of people who say that um, the tribulation is something which happened when Jerusalem fell in AD 70. So they are not even really expecting any kind of a tribulation period to happen in the future, in the end times. They say that all the passages which talk about, you know, uh, an intense time of persecution, those passages are referring to AD 70, when Jerusalem fell. This may not really be a very valid view, uh, because, you know, that was just the fall of one city. It affected one people group. Uh, but then the kind of persecution that is described in Revelation, it doesn't just impact one city and one people group. It's a revelation. Uh, it, it's a time of persecution that people of all uh, races they face, and you know it says that tribes and people from all nations, you know, were, um, were, were held on to the Lord and uh, they proved their loyalty to the Lord. So. Um, we cannot say that the tribulation period only talks about 70 AD. There's another term that is mentioned in your um, notes, and that is hyperpreterism. That's even more vague. Okay, that theory of hyperpreterism that basically says that we are already living, it seems, in the new heaven and the new earth, which means what we have now is what we are always going to have. Sin will never be completely wiped out. Satan will never be completely defeated. I mean, I don't know from where they came up with such a, uh, such an idea, because if you look at the scriptures, we clearly see that Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire one day. And we are told that the, the current earth and the heavens will be rolled up. So um, hyper preterism is so um, unbiblical that we don't even have to take it seriously. Um, so. When these Thessalonian believers lose a loved one, and even we in our current age, when we, when our loved ones die, we do not have to mourn, we do not have to feel sad, um, because we know that they are safe and secure with God. And if the rapture happens during our lifetime, when, when we see Jesus coming down in the clouds, we will actually, we actually see even our relatives, our loved ones, our family members because they'll come down along with him to collect all of us. And we will see them being rejoined with a resurrected body. And while that is going on, we will also rise up into the air. And we also, in a, in a twinkling of an eye, he'll talk about that in the in Second Thessalonians. Our bodies also will, be, will turn into resurrected bodies. We didn't undergo the experience of dying and you know being buried and cremated and all of that. Uh, but in that moment, while we are rising up into the air, we also will receive resurrected bodies. So our relatives who went before us, they will receive their resurrected bodies, and we too will receive it in that moment. 
and it will it will all happen during a rapture in the clouds in the air where we meet with the lord so um, second coming is something which will take place after the seven years of tribulation that's as, at least the you know the belief that we hold on to uh, but of course different people have different opinions regarding this matter all right um, we will uh, start chapter 5 next week uh, so we know we'll just finish early today now uh, because i don't want to get into the new chapter and the concluding thoughts that he has over there that's a separate section by itself we'll deal with it next class all right then let's just close with a word of prayer lord we thank you for the things that we could learn in uh, from the thessalonian letter today uh, we pray oh lord uh, that like these uh, thessalonian believers we will continue to live to please you uh, paul said uh, that he was pleased with the way that they were living uh, in honoring the lord and he said do this more and more so we pray o oh lord that we will never become complacent and satisfied with our level but we will continue to work towards becoming more and more like you because that is the goal which pleases you so we pray o oh lord that there would not be any stagnation in our lives but we would continue to uh, move into greater intimacy with you we also thank you o oh lord for the great hope which we have in you that death can do nothing to us we thank you o oh lord that we and our loved ones are safe in you and we thank you for the privilege which we are going to have one day of receiving resurrected bodies and uh, that we will have the joy of uh having the same kind of resurrected body that Jesus Christ has we thank you oh lord for that honor and privilege as well thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much